Great Britain, 1990s. A terrible threat hangs over the kingdom. It hasn't come from elsewhere. It is already in action in a parallel universe, that of the wizards. A powerful black wizard, he who must not be named for fear of dire consequences, is plotting to rule the world and subject it to a reign of terror. At the same time, a young orphan enrolls at the School of Witchcraft and Wizardry, not realizing that his destiny is to fight the Dark Lord to the death. It is at Hogwarts boarding school in Scotland that Harry Potter gradually discovers the role he must play in this battle. Helped by his friends Ron and Hermione, the young wizard must confront the army of darkness, made up of Death Eaters and Dementors from the terrifying island prison of Azkaban. Albus Dumbledore, the head wizard at Hogwarts who is leading the resistance, will be his mentor for the most powerful spells. Voldemort's victory will never be complete as long as Harry Potter lives. The real story of Harry Potter begins in Edinburgh. Scotland's fantastic and mysterious capital is a UNESCO-designated city of literature and has already inspired numerous authors. The start of 1994, J.K. Rowling, who was unknown to the general public at the time, was a regular visitor to a tea room in the old town. This was where she wrote the first volume of this fantasy saga which was to become a worldwide phenomenon of children's literature and cinema. She spent hours filling pages with stories born of her imagination, identifying her characters and imagining wizards, scenery and fantastical creatures, which would go on to make up the world of Harry Potter. For her fans from around the world, this cafe is the starting point for a pilgrimage through this fantasy series. The walls of the toilets are covered with their handwritten messages, left here to express their gratitude to the author. From the cafe window, the writer could cast her eyes over Castle Rock, which towers above the old town, medieval in its origins. The old center of Edinburgh is a maze of alleys and dark courtyards. Its dramatic architecture reflects its troubled past. The old town is the ideal setting for a fantasy novel. They look for prostitutes, homeless, travelers, Anyone they didn't think people would notice that they went missing. They would get them blind drunk before very kindly offering them a bed in their house for the night. Upon getting them back to their house, Burke would sit on their stomach and Hare would shove his fingers down their throat, forcing them to throw up before choking to death on their own sick. And the reason they use this method is... Edinburgh abounds in sordid stories, bloody anecdotes and mysterious legends, each one more real than the last. The author of Harry Potter enjoyed wandering here in the old graveyard of Greyfriars Church, the most famous graveyard in the whole of Scotland. It was here, with its very special atmosphere, where J.K. Rowling took the name Tom Riddle, who soon became known as Lord Voldemort. Earlier I was telling you about the Covenanters, the religious reformers of the 17th century who were persecuted for their views. After they were defeated in battle, some of the, the very zealous um, Covenanters were defeated in 1679. 1,200 of them were brought to Edinburgh as prisoners. Now, there were too many to keep them in the castle, so they were actually held in a temporary prison that was set up in a field to the south of Greyfriars. Essentially, it was a concentration camp. And hundreds of them went on to die. They were sentenced to death by a man called George Mackenzie. 
known as Bloody Mackenzie because of his zeal for As night falls, mysterious silhouettes dance around this graveyard and costume storytellers recount sinister tales which still resonate in the Scottish capital. This is the famous sword of the Highland Warriors, the formidable Claymore, which is held in two hands and which caused so much devastation on the battlefields. In a small workshop in Edinburgh, a fencing master reproduces faithful replicas of swords used by legendary Scottish figures, such as Robert the Bruce, crowned King of Scotland in 1306, or Rob Roy McGregor, a famous outlaw and popular hero from the start of the 18th century. For over 20 years, Paul MacDonald has been producing these completely authentic weapons. The swords that come out of his workshop are not toys or decorative objects to be hung on the wall. At this time, you would only, only have carried a sword if it was, it was part of your profession. Uh, swords in the 14th century were not carried by civilians on the street. Um, they were really just at this time carried by soldiers, men at arms, uh, engaged in warfare and conflict. A little bit more fooling just on this one. It's good for next stage. This type of sword is, is of a size that's designed to be used with one hand first. Uh, the grip is large enough that you can also have a second hand on the sword for stronger blows, stronger cuts, stronger defense, um, but it's mostly designed to be used in one hand. But the blade is long enough and also has enough weight. It's really, I would say, ideal for a cavalry sword. So I think this sword is a good example of a medieval cavalry sword. Um, it could deliver very strong cuts from horseback. And uh, a good cut with an edge like this against flesh and bone it's more than a scratch. It's, uh, you could remove a, a hand, an arm, a leg, a head, cleanly with a single cut from a sword like this. I think I've always been creative. I've always liked making things and doing things with my hands uh, since I was young. Um, but I never really had a, an outlet for that uh, until coming to Edinburgh. Defend yourself from a sword uh, is either done by the art of not being there, moving quickly enough. You can defend very strongly against strong cuts very easily. On the hills overlooking Edinburgh, Paul MacDonald practices the art of fencing. Over the centuries, the Scottish capital has seen many a warrior cross swords, and in her saga, J.K. Rowling makes the sword the weapon of choice for eliminating evil forces. London and Wales may have provided the locations for many of the sets in the Harry Potter films, but it is in the mist of this northern land that the bulk of the story unfolds. It was this dramatic light, these rugged mountains, and these steep-sided valleys that J.K. Rowling had in mind when she set the scene of the fatal confrontation between Harry Potter and Voldemort. A number of scenes were set in the west of Scotland, in the region of Glenfinnan. This is where the famous Hogwarts Express ran, the steam train which took Harry Potter to his school of witchcraft and wizardry.
Every morning from the month of May onwards, the Harry Potter train runs a daily service between Fort William and the small town of Malag. When does it cross the ride up to Glenfinnan? Um, if you're there and set up for about quarter to 11, we should be there just after that. OK. OK. Hogwarts Express is actually the Jacobite steam train, which came into service over 30 years ago and covers the legendary Small Isle route. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Florence and I'm your guard today. West Coast Railway Company would like to welcome you on board this 1015 steam service to Malig, arriving in Malig at 12.20. A decade or so on from the film's release, the fame that this little train acquired in the cinema shows no sign of abating. Wizards, young and old, come here to fulfill a dream. The real star of this journey is the famous Glenfinnan Viaduct, a bridge about 30 metres high with 21 arches, which nowadays owes its fame to the adventures of Harry Potter. But there is more to Glenfinnan than this architectural masterpiece. There is also a lock, some mountains, and the home of Ian McFarlane, a forester and musician. There's nobody lives down this loch for this side for the best part of 15 miles. There's no roads, it's wilderness, complete wilderness. And uh, there's, when I was young, this was all sheep farming. Uh, everywhere you see thousands of sheep, it's probably 3,000 sheep here, another two and a half down there. It's an honour, really, to be able to grow up and live and work in somewhere like this. It's, uh, you, it's not something you take for granted. You, you feel it. You feel how lucky you are, you know, to, to live here. So we always say around here, we get so much rain that one day like this is worth six months of rain. <laughs> and that keeps us here. Uphill from the now famous viaduct, Alistair Gibson is the steward of the vast Glenfinnan estate, which comprises a series of forests and hills extending over more than 4,000 hectares. From October onwards, Alistair spends nearly every day climbing the surrounding peaks in search of the monarch of the Glen, the Red Deer Stag. My job as stalker is to control the population. We have lost the natural predators, the bears, the wolves, the lynxes. We cull about 100 deer a year on Glenfinnan Estate, of which 25 are stags. 60 odd are hinds, and we have to take followers as well, calves that are late born, poor, won't live through the winter. What you see around you here, the grass, the heather, uh, it would become uh, poor, overgrazed, and you would have peaks and troughs in the population level because the, if we didn't control them, the population would rise and rise until there wasn't enough food, and then it would crash. 
The wild Scottish red deer stag lives in a herd and positions itself on the peaks to get a better view so that it can protect its females. The stag is um, very keen and very active for, for three weeks. He is um, strong and looking after a harem, a, a group of ladies. There could be 15, 20 ladies he's looking after. And he keeps, keeps them together and he mates with them when he can. The technique would be have the wind in your face so as they're not smelling you. They're very sensitive to that. Stealth, quietly. They're very sensitive. They can hear you loading the rifle. We load the rifle two, 300 meters away, crawl into 100 meters, slide the barrel through the grass, and uh, approach that way. That's, uh, their eyesight is very, very good. I think um, uh, an icon of, of, the, of the highlands, you, you would have the, the red stag, and maybe an eagle would be iconic of the highlands. And uh, we, we, we are very proud of our stags. They are not massive stags that you find on the woods. They have adapted to live in the open hill. They have become smaller, but they are very wise as well. In lots of stories, the stag is a savior. In Harry Potter, it symbolizes the protective spirit of Harry's father when it appears to him in an ethereal and luminous form. Downhill from the viaduct, Ian McFarlane likes to go out on his boat on Loch Shiel, a freshwater lake 25 kilometers long, surrounded by mountains, peat bogs, and ancient pastures. Going back in history, it's probably not the remote uh, bare hills that you, you see now. It was worked by all the people living up and down the, the loch side, hundreds of people. They would have all been carving a, a life out of uh, this tough terrain, planting crops and tending their cattle and maybe a few sheep and some goats. The traffic on the loch would have been quite busy because everyone travelled by boat. For centuries, Loch Shiel was of strategic importance as a transport route through the mountains. It used to flow into the sea. This vast loch features in all the films in the Harry Potter series. It is here that part of the second task of the Tri-Wizard Tournament was filmed. Harry Potter flew over Loch Shiel on his hippogriff. Halfway across, on the biggest island on the lake, lie the ruins of a very old chapel, which would have been the dwelling place of a saint. For centuries, it has watched over the tombs of important members of Scottish clans. It's not just a, a monument, there's, it's still an active graveyard and there's still local families are, are buried uh, here, mostly from the Harachal and uh, the Strontian area. You see new graves as well as ancient graves here. And uh, I believe there's thousands and thousands of people buried here and they've, they've been layered and layered over the, over the centuries. 
Traditionally, the, the loch is the, is the border between um, North Argyll and Moidart on the other side. And the burial isle itself was uh, on the Moidart side Catholic. And uh, so the, the Catholic graves are on the, the northwest side of the island. And on the southwest, you had the people from Argyllshire who were predominantly Episcopalian and Church of Scotland. So the two, so they all, they, they all lie in peace together, which is quite nice. On the edge of the lake is a 300-year-old manor house. Ian McFarlane has lived here all his life. My mother and father ran a hotel, and my father's a bagpiper and fiddle player. And uh, a lot of his, uh, his friends would come in and play music. And I have very, very early images of these wonderful looking uh, people, old people, having great fun, sitting together, sharing tunes, stories, and, uh, and songs. And I, I just always thought from a very young age, I, I just want to be sitting in there, be part of that. The manor house at Glenfinnan is famous in Scottish history. This is where, on the banks of Loch Shiel, the Prince Regent, Charles Edward Stuart, landed, rallying hundreds of Highlanders to his cause. The last Scottish rebellion set off from this lake. In the Harry Potter series, this lake was also the setting for Hogwarts, the famous school of witchcraft and wizardry. Edinburgh is home to the most famous school in the north of the United Kingdom, Fetters College. Founded in 1870, Fetters College was originally a boarding school for orphans and poor children. Today, the Gothic-style castle, inspired by the chateaus on the Loire, welcomes young pupils from the world over. 800 pupils attend the school from primary level to the end of secondary level. This is where ex-Prime Minister Tony Blair went to school. Hogwarts Castle would not exist had it not come from the imagination of the author of Harry Potter. But J.K. Rowling was partly inspired by this famous boarding school when she set the scene for her school of witchcraft and wizardry. So, groups of four, one group of three, girls and boys in each of the groups. OK, and then get yourselves at one of these stations, starting with the paper copies first. Then after seven and a half minutes, I should be quite precise about this, I will let you go online. Seven and a half minutes, you do the books. Marcus, age 12, joined Fetus this year. The school has transported this young boy to another world. I think my first impression was quite... Kind of surprising. I didn't really, 
I didn't really imagine how big and how kind of amazing it is. Like every little detail in the building, it looks, it looks like it's all ancient and it, it, it wasn't what I was used to. I think it was, it was quite unrealistic at first. It's like being in a castle. It's, it's just massive and awesome. Turn for Theo, yeah. Hamish, yeah. Tom, yeah. Marcus, yeah. Ross, yeah. David, yeah. Thomas, yeah. Rio, yeah. Fian. Just like in the School of Witchcraft and Wizardry, where the pupils belong to different houses, Fetus has nine houses spread out around the main building. Marcus has joined Carrington House. He's now about three weeks away, less than three weeks. So and you go back to your house and it feels like you're just you're, you're going back back home. It's, it's not really like you're at school. It's more like you're, you've invited your friends ho over for a day and you're just spending, spending an afternoon with them. But otherwise, it just feels really homely and relaxed and everyone's really open to chat with you and it just feels like you're at home. Lesson start sharp at 10 2, boys. Have a good day today. <laughs> Ancient Greek, modern Greek, Latin, Mandarin, physics, biology, visual arts and sports. Fetters College aims for excellence. Being a Fetisian is great, even in our places. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, I definitely feel proud. So long ago, before you, before me, before your great-grandmother and your great-great-grandfather, there were no people. There were only animals, there were only trees. And on the winter of these years, there was a small robin. Now he was blown from his flight to the ground and injured his wing. A robin cannot fly on an injured wing. So he approached a local group of trees for shelter, for food, only in tow the spring months came again. Oh, Oak, please, can you give me shelter? Please, can you give me food? Just until I'm better to fly away. However, the Oak was slumbering in these winter months and could not answer. The forest is a recurring theme in fantasy stories. Forests are generally home to all sorts of strange and wild creatures, each more dangerous than the next. In the depths of night, the woods are not a reassuring place to be. In the highlands in autumn, there is a place which is transformed at dusk. The enchanted Fascali Forest offers an illuminated nocturnal stroll like you've never seen before. Strung with lights of various shapes and colors, the forest's natural decor has been illuminated by an installation imagined by the young British artist, Kate Bonney. The very first brief for the very first event was um, to bring people out to the woods, out to the forest at night, in the dark, uh, and encourage them to look up at the canopy. Because normally when you walk around a forest, you look at your feet to make sure you don't trip up and see, because in this part of Scotland, we have some of Europe's tallest trees. Created about 15 years ago, this sound and light installation set over 66 hectares of forest has acquired a big reputation. All the income generated goes to charity. We 
try to create a journey where you get the opportunity to enjoy the natural beauty or to feel that there might be something mystical or mysterious that you, you can't interpret. And also points where you just feel a little bit nervous or a little bit scared just by not being quite sure what's, what's there. In the autumn for a month, the enchanted Faskali Forest receives more than 55,000 visitors of all ages from countries all over the world. In Harry Potter, going into the forest at night is a punishment. Those who venture there may never return. And the robin was able to fly away. The creator had been watching this, had received all these words from animals of the kindness of the pine, and approached the trees. Oak, birch, you were asked for help and ignored an innocent, defenseless animal, whereas the holly and the pine did not turn away from them. Their reward is they will keep their leaves green all through the winter months, but you will lose yours. And thus autumn was born, and the leaves fall from the trees of the oak and the birch, but the pine and the holly still say green and fresh for all those who need comfort, shelter, and food. And that's how we have autumn. In the series of films about the young wizard, there is one recurring, easily identifiable setting, Loch Elt, with its little wooded island situated at the tip of the lake. It is here that Albus Dumbledore's tomb lies. east coast of Scotland, opposite the small seaside town of North Berwick, lies the uninhabited island of Bass Rock. For centuries, this Scottish island had a terrible reputation. Like has command, the prison for wizards, which J.K. Rowling also situates in the North Sea, Bass Rock was a formidable prison. In the 15th century, King James I of Scotland consigned his political opponents to a life sentence there. Bass Rock is home to the largest colony of gannets, or in Latin, Morris Bassinus, in the world, hence its name. Its surface has been whitened by the feces of the 200,000 odd birds who live there. For over 40 years, one woman, Maggie, has been coming to observe them regularly. Just last year, we became the largest gannetry, northern gannetry in the world, and this is fabulous. How cool is this? Over 75,000 breeding pairs. As an island, as I say, of research now and study, very important. But what's so wonderful is we're not wild and remote. The gannets arrived back here as early as March, well, as early as January. They're territorial, they're very territorial, so they fight for their territories. And you can see, even now, although the breeding season is over, the chicks have left, most of the chicks have left, the gannets are staying, and that's because the territory is the most important thing to the gannet. <laughs> Thank you. 
where really the young chick straight off starts to yip yip and tap the bill of the adult. It's like, I'm here, I'm here, give me my dinner. But the adults will do their bonding. And usually the one that's about to leave points its bill to the sky and it's to say to its partner, OK, I'm off now. You stay, you're in charge. But the young bird will have had a feed, as we saw. And it's not delicate. The young bird straight, the head goes straight into the bill of the adult and the adult regurgitates the fish. The rock is not only for the gannets, it was a prison, it was a fortress, it was a place of religious retreat, and this was a dreadful place to be imprisoned. As you walk through the cells, the footsteps we've walked in today, many a prisoner has gone to his death here. Conditions were such that it was cold. Food was scarce, you relied on family to bring you food. The cells were small, they did have fires in them, but they were smoky, so you had really no windows in them, and it was dreadful conditions. Some of the prisoners along here at Tintalan Castle, and they would hang them in front of the prisoners here, just to say, this is what is happening to your friends on the mainland. Give up your cause, give up your fight about religion. The equivalent of Alcatraz for the Wizards of Harry Potter may have been inspired by this place, from which there was no escape other than by death or insanity. The prison fortress was partly destroyed in the 19th century, and all that remains is this unique site, which has become a sanctuary for thousands of birds. Every year for 30 years, Carlton Hill, which overlooks Edinburgh, has played host to a tradition which dates back to ancient times. The Beltane Fire Festival is an intense and colourful pagan festival, which celebrates the arrival of summer with the help of numerous fires, drums and costumes. Beltane originally is uh, one of the, the Celtic Quarter Day festivals um, celebrated by ancient Celtic peoples um, in, in the Iron Age. Um, here in this area, there were many Iron Age hill forts, uh, Celtic people living on the hill behind me on uh, the back of Salisbury Crags on, on, on Arthur Seat. Um, in modern times, um, in 1988, um, a group of people who were involved in um, kind of site-specific performance and what have you decided that they would um, resurrect this ancient festival. is the star of the festival. She leads a long procession to celebrate the increasing light and strength of the sun. It marks the return of fine summer's days and the fertility of humans and the land. The Green Man, winter's ambassador, is resigned to his fate of dying in order to be reborn anew. The group of reds represents the fire, which stands for pure instinct and the unstoppable force of life.
In ancient communities, fire was an essential element of life. In Harry Potter, it is a factor in the killing curse, which is unblockable and leads to instant death in a bright flash of green light. volunteers and over 10,000 spectators, the Beltane Fire Festival is one of a kind. Edinburgh and Scotland, so rich in legends, mysteries and fantastic mythologies, could not help but inspire the author of the famous Harry Potter series.